Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to In Conversation with a Survivor Speaker Series. Whether it's your first time joining us or you've been with us for previous sessions, first time, welcome. We are thrilled to have you as part of this important programming. My name is Daniela Lurion. I'm the Tour for Humanity Director and part of the education team here at the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center. As we are getting started, I'll take a moment to remind everyone to please keep their videos off and their mics muted. This presentation is being recorded. As we begin, I also want to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are currently on. While we are, of course, meeting today on a virtual platform, please do take a moment to consider the importance of the lands and waters that feed our bodies and souls. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral lands of the ter and territories of all the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people who call this land home. I'm proud today to be joined by Michael Levitt, FSWC President and CEO, Hannah Marazzi, Special Advisor to the Honorable Erwin Kotler, and of course, our wonderful guest speaker for today, Rose Lipsick. There will be an opportunity for questions, so please feel free to send them at your leisure directly to me using the chat function here on Zoom. Depending on timing, we'll do our best to address as many of them as possible. To begin, Hannah will offer a few opening remarks. Hannah Marazzi serves as Special Advisor to the Honorable Erwin Kotler, Canada's inaugural Special Envoy for Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and com Combating Antisemitism. Previously, she served with the United Nations, the National Think Tank CARDIS, and served as co-editor of Opt-in, a Beginner's Handbook to Canadian Politics. Hannah, thank you so much for being here today. Of course. Well, I know I say this every week, but you are in for a treat today. I have the privilege always of logging on just a few minutes before you all do and had the chance to uh, hear a little bit about what Rose was saying, and uh, I can't wait for you to hear it too. Uh, Professor Erwin Kotler sends his regrets, um, but as always wants to honor and celebrate uh, how important this series is, and uh, particularly I know I'm not alone at this at this time in, in history, at this time in, in the calendar year. Um, I, as spring sort of dawns, it, it strikes me that um, as we see the earth kind of come to to renew and reorient, you know, itself. Um, so too is this an opportunity through um, listening to stories like Rose's to renew and reorient ourselves um, towards belonging, towards the cause of justice, um, and towards the stories that have shaped um, who we are and who we can be to to one another so rose your wisdom uh, is going to be such a gift to us i want to thank the friends of simon wiesenthal center for gosh the incredible work that they do you know this is one of many many things that that they do and i know uh i speak for so many of us when i say that it is their sort of not sort of their, their faithful work in a long direction that that uh it shapes uh, the country that we call home, the communities that we belong to. And uh, Rose, um, over to you. What a privilege and honor it is uh, to listen to you and learn from you today. Oh, hello, good afternoon. I'm Rose Lipsick, near Ruzia Handelsman. I come from Poland, Lublin, Poland a city of about 43,000 Jewish souls, which very few survived. Lublin was a, not a very good place to live during the war years. I had a father, mother, and two brothers, my older brother and my younger brother. And I have to say, my younger brother was the love of my life. I loved the child so much that I don't think I ever mourned anybody as I mourned that little boy. My father was a tailor and my mother was a housewife. And we were basically, for the Polish standard, middle-class people. My whole extended family lived in Lublin. As a matter of fact, I lived on Grotzka 30. If anybody visited Lublin will know that Grotzka became a famous street. And uh, the building that I used to live is a nice hotel, which I slept when I did my documentary. Just wanna tell you a little bit about my mother and father. My father, when the war broke out in 1939, 
and I contacted Scarlet Fever. For six weeks, my father made it a point that every evening after he worked, he sat down and read to me all the stories of Shalom Aleichem. My mother was a very bright woman. I remember one teacher used to tell me, oh, Paul, the Jewish mother, your mother speaks the best Polish. I used to be so proud of it. Cecilia Janiec was her name. She was my grade three teacher. I was born in 1929. That made me about 10 years old when the war broke out. And that finished my education. I was talking about my mother. In 1939, when the first German brought people into our city, I don't know from where, from a small town in Poland, in the middle of the winter, and dropped them in a market in the middle of the night. My mother was the one that ran down there, picked up a family of a husband, wife, and a little girl, and brought them home. And they stayed with us in the small premises that we lived. My mother gave them a place to live until we were thrown out of that place. In 1939, you know, Poland was divided. The Russians came in from one side and Germany came in from the other side. And a large part of my mother's, all my mother's brothers and, and two sisters ran away to the other side, hoping that there maybe is gonna be a little better. We didn't think they're gonna kill us all, but especially men, we thought they're gonna to take to labor camps. So four of my mother brother, brothers and two sisters, one was married already. And the one that was married was caught by the Russians, which they told her she had no right to live there because she came from the other side and send it to Siberia. I'm, I remember when a letter came that she was sent to Siberia, my grandmother said, oh, I'm never, never gonna see my daughter again. Little did she know that her daughter was the one that's gonna survive, but she won't. My mother's brothers and the youngest sister came, all came back in 1941 when, when Germany invaded Russia and they all perished except for one who survived with me. I think I never remember to tell my mother's name. Her name was Deborah Handelsman. My father was laser. My little older brother was easy and my little brother was Hennig. By 1943 or 41, when they first made the ghetto in Lublin, they threw us out of our premises. They told us that we cannot live there. Only the people that are gonna work for the Germans are gonna live there. So we took our possessions, whatever we could carry, because they wouldn't let you take your furniture, your think with you. And we went to Osmolice, which is 20 kilometers from Lublin, a small village. My grandmother's birthplace, where we used to go every summer on vacations. And there was a cousin of my mother's that lived there. She had a small little house, like three rooms, a kitchen, a bedroom, and one more room, and had two children. So she couldn't put us up, but she had a shack in the back. So she took the check and she said, why don't you live in the check? But the winters in Poland are very, very severe, just like in Canada. So we put sticks around the shack and filled it with dry leaves to keep us warm. And we had a little wooden stove in the middle under, under earth because there was no floor, it was just earth. But you know what, those times were not so bad. For 1940, I don't remember when the ghetto, I think at the beginning of 41 when it started, I don't remember the dates exactly. 
Till 1942, we lived there and it wasn't so bad because it was a small village and the Germans didn't bother to come there very much, but we had to live, we had to eat. So we went, my mother took me and my little brother and we used to work in the fields. And Poland had a feudalistic system. There were the very rich farmers and the very poor farmers that worked for the rich farmers. So we used to work, there were two, two big places, Osmolica and Żabiewola, that they had big, big farms that they had people working for. So you we used to pick sugar beets. Sugar beets are, uh, sugar isn't only made from canes. In Poland, it's from beets. I remember walking with my mother one afternoon from the fields. My little brother was holding my hand. And my mother said, such a beautiful world, but there doesn't seem to be any place for us. We, we knew a farmer that my grandmother knew from years and years ago when she was a little girl. And we used to come to his place sometimes to trade. You know, my aunt, the one that ran away to Russia that was taken to Siberia was married in 1936 and she married a, a baker and he, it was quite a, a good marriage. And she had beautiful things which she left behind. So we took those things with us to Osmolids and we were selling them to farmers. That's how we lived because we had to eat. My father stayed for a little while in the ghetto to work, to try and make a living. And then he joined us in the village. So it wasn't such horror in the village. When all my uncles came back, we all stayed in that village for a while until 1942. In 1942 came an order that we should congregate in a small town by the name of Belzitsa. So everybody started running. At the same time, in March, um, excuse me a minute, in March 1942, they liquidated the Lublin ghetto. Most people of Lublin disappeared. Nobody knew where. We never heard from any of them. So this was by 1942, October, when they told us to liquidate, we should come to Belzitsa. We had terrible suspicions that it wasn't very good. So my uncle's tries, they still had a small ghetto in Lublin by the name of Tat uh, Majdanek Tatarski. You know, Lublin had the famous Majdanek anyway, the concentration camp. But there was for a while a small ghetto which called Majdana Tatarsky. A lot, a lot of my mother's brother's family run there, run there. But my mother, my father, my two brothers, we went where they told us to go, to Belzitsa. We slept one night in a front store, storefront, and one bed, all five of us. But the next morning came a knock on the door rouse. They took us out and they put us on a, on a marketplace. You know, Poland is very famous for their marketplace. Their farmers used to come to, the, to, the, to sell their goods in the little town. But that day it was empty, except for all the people from the surrounding areas of the city of Lublin. They were congregated on that marketplace. That's the day I lost everything. They took us on that market and they started dividing us. Men and women with our children to one side and women and children to the other side. The last time I saw my father, they took him by, away by a truck. I have no idea where he perished. I thought always maybe my Danik, but maybe not. I have no idea which camp they took him and where he worked and when he died. My mother, my older brother, he was still a young boy, and me, we started walking the road. 
they put us on a road which was going to a train station in Nijvica. As we started walking on the road with the few possessions that we carried, it was a beautiful October 13th day. That road must have held at least 3,000 people walking and carrying those big bags, really hoping that they're gonna put us up some other place to live. But my mother decided, looked at me, started holding back and holding back and holding back. And we were almost at the end where there was just a few wagons with people that couldn't walk. And she, it was a beautiful sunny day that afternoon. She grabbed whatever I carried and she threw it down the road. Whatever she carried, she threw it down. And she says, that's the last, last day of my life. But the only hope I hope that you're gonna run. You have to run. We're gonna die today. Run, and if you live, I'll live through you. I don't believe the whole world has gone mad. There's gonna be somebody somewhere that's gonna help you and you will survive. And if you will, so will I through you. Well, being 13 at the time, I was tightly holding onto my mother's skirt. There was no way I was gonna leave and go on my own. But as we were almost passing a few little houses on top, there was a little hill and she forcibly pushed me off the road. The last guard came over. He was the last guard. I wasn't particularly looking Jewish, blonde hair, freckled face, unbelievable freckled face and blue eyes. And he said to me, he thought maybe a little girl came down to see what's happening on the road. And he says, are, are you Jewish? Are you a Jewish girl? And I looked at him and I was so afraid that I, my mouth was shut and didn't say a word. But somebody on those wagons, it must have been some Paul, he yelled, don't you see she's just a Polish girl? And that was the last card. I don't much remember of that day. All I know is I ran through the fields. She must have told me to go to that Polish farmer by the name of Stanislav Jabloński that we used to visit. And I used to play with these girls. He had three girls. Because that's where I wound up. At night, I knocked on that farmer's little farmer's door. And he, it was already dusk coming. A whole day I ran. I don't remember much how I made it there. And I knocked on the door and he let me in. And to my shocking surprise, my grandmother was there. She came from the city of Lublin to beg the Jablonski family, because she knew them well, she knew his wife and him, and I think she knew her when she was a child. And she, because she knew he had three daughters and her youngest daughter, my youngest aunt, my mother's youngest sister, was there with, with her in Lublin. Amazing that they were with the father-in-law of that one that ran away to Russia because he was a baker. He was still baking bread for the Germans. So they let him walk free still in the city of Lublin. And he was staying on a, a Shiroka street in Lublin. And she stayed there with him. A Polish woman approached her and said to her, her name is Ruzia too. Ruzia Finkelstein was her name my mother's youngest sister. And she said to her, you speak a perfect Polish. You got beautiful blue eyes. She was 21 at the time. She said to her, why don't you try? The only chance you've got. If you stay in, in Lublin, you're gonna die. The only chance you've got, if you pretend to be a Polish girl and go to Germany to work as a Polish laborer, 
because you know Germany had taken forced labor from all the occupied countries in Europe because their factories were empty. They didn't have anybody to run their factories. So my grandmother went to the Tsiablonski. She walked the 18 kilometers from the city to beg him. And that's where, that's the day I ran away. That's the day my grandmother found me there. And she said, where is your mother? We're looking for you. They were looking for you. My aunt said she would go to Germany, but she doesn't want to go by herself. And she didn't have anybody else. I was the eldest from the grandchildren. So she decided when, when my mother pushed me around, how did that connect that the same day I met my grandmother, the same day they were looking for me, and the same day the family, I slept one night in their home, and that family gave me a birth certificate for my aunt. She only had one, he only had one birth certificate, but he had three daughters. So I called myself Helena Jabloniska, and my aunt called herself Loja Jabloniska. With that birth certificate, I slept the one night at that farmer's house. The next morning, he took me to the train station to go to the city of Lublin and meet up with my aunt and try to become Polish girls and go voluntarily to Germany to work. It's interesting. Here is a Polish farmer that's risking his life to help me, and he takes me to by wagon and horse and wagon to the station. He puts me on a train. And when I, the minute I walk into the train, all I hear, isn't that wonderful? We're getting rid of all the Jews. Can you imagine my face, the fear on my face? And all of a sudden I look around and there stands a Polish woman that I know. She used to be my grandmother's friend. Her name was Antosha. She looks at me, she grabs me by the shoulders, puts me against the window and says, be quiet, my child. And that's the way that I, I traveled to Lublin. And then I had to walk the streets and be petrified if somebody's gonna recognize me. I was born there, I lived all my life there. And I met up with my Aunt Rose and both of us walked into the center which was Krochmalna Ulitsa. I don't, I even remember the street where they kept all the people that they forced to go to Germany to work, Polish men and women. We volunteered, but they said they don't take 13 year olds. So she said, I'm not going if she doesn't go. So they took me. That week was the hardest week because we were petrified if some one Polish girl walks in that knows my end. She went to school there too, but we were lucky nobody recognized us. It's interesting. One day I was Ruzia Handelsman. The next day I was Helena Jabloniska on the way to Germany to work. Ger we, it took us a whole week on a train to arrive at our destination. They divided to different places. They divided us and sent us to Bremen Grown, about 20 kilometers out of the city of Bremenhaven, to work in a factory where they were making, uh, uh, you know, ropes for, for ships and things. And, Oh my God, there were 90 girls living in one little house where I was sent to live with my aunt. Can you just imagine, you know, a German didn't recognize a Jew, but a Paul recognized that you a mile away. Here, I'm really, I have to say that I own my life to three people. My Mother, first and most of all, for pushing me off the road. My aunt Rose, that she took on a 13 wild little girl. 
she was only 21 and took on the responsibility of taking me with. And the Yablonski family, who all through the years that I was in Germany, wrote to us letters like they were our parents. Actually, they, they're supposed to be honored a few years ago, a righteous among nations, because I met her grandchildren I connected with. But because of COVID, still nothing happened. I don't know if I'll be able to go to Poland. It was supposed to be in Warsaw, the ceremony. Anyway, that's, an, that's the three people I owe my life, really. But just imagine, I come into a place and I have to tell a story about the life that never happened and to remember it the next day. Don't think that they treated the Poles very well. We used to wear a P to, rec to be recognized that we are Poles. They made you work 12 hours. I was the only one in the whole factory that worked eight hours because they felt sorry of me. Such a skinny little thing I was. So I was the only one that worked eight hours. Hunger and lice are, were indescribable. I didn't know how to deal with my hair. I had a little curly hair and every time it rained, I curl came out. I used to put them in braids and the, little, the girls used to make fun of me. You, you look like a little Zhidovechka, a little Jewish girl. The fear was with us all the time. I don't know if anybody knows, but me and my aunt became like, we never had to talk to one another. I just looked at her and she knew what I wanted. She realized what I wanted from her or she, or she wanted from me because you could not speak. Walls have ears. If we ever wanted to talk to one another, we used to go out the fields and talk. And she used to say, do you think we're gonna manage? We're gonna survive? She asked me, I was a kid, and I said, I don't know, I, my mother told me I will, so I believed it. I said, oh yes, we will. In this way, I helped her. In other ways, I was a pain, a real pain, because I used to get myself into all kinds of trouble. One day, as we were walking to the factory, me my, and my sister, she was my sister there, and with two other Polish friends that we uh, were friendly with, two other girls. And there was this German little boy jumped out and screamed out at us, Polish wine, which means Polish pig. Now, can you just imagine me jumping out and yelling at him and forgetting myself and yelling in Jewish? I'm going to break all your teeth. Well, the fear and the trauma of realization, what I just did, I couldn't remember a Jewish word the next day. It was just lucky that those Polish girls didn't realize what was happening. The language went out of my head in one minute. The two of us, my aunt and I started giggling, laughing like two crazy idiots because we were so petrified of what I did. But I forgot the language for three years. I never, took me three months after the war to be able to speak it again. The work was very hard and the hunger was constant. I don't know how much time I have. Can anybody tell me? You have about half an hour left, Rose. Oh, I still have time. I, I was just, should I tell them a story about the pudding? Is anybody interested? It's, it's quite a funny story. I think interested to tell whatever you want to talk about, people okay. want to listen. So what, what happened one day, you know, they used to give us two pieces of bread, some margarine, which I hate till today, and one soup a day and the pudding. Let's not forget the pudding. But the soup was given to us in the factory. And we used to get tickets. 
And every time we wanted the soup, we had to give a ticket to the woman that was serving the soup in, 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 the, in the factory. One day I, we were sitting and we all give the tickets. There was one Polish woman that actually was injured, a finger she injured in 1940. She came to Germany very early. So they allowed her to stay home so she would be cleaning the place. But she spoke a perfect German and she had connection with the German woman. So everybody else was cleaning, not her. But she was helping serve the soup. Anyway, I got, gave the ticket, I got my soup, which consisted of some veggies. That's about all, we didn't see meat or fall or fish for three years. And there was a woman next to me, one Polish girl, and she gave the ticket to, and the German woman said to her, no, you didn't give me the ticket. You're not getting your soup. She was going to work 12 hour shift in the factory. And she didn't have any bread, any left, bread left over. And she was so hungry. She says, I gave you the ticket. So the German woman, Anna was her name. She said, wait a minute. If that Polish girl, Mirka is gonna bring back an extra pudding, that means that you gave it to me. But if there's no extra pudding, then that means that you didn't give me the ticket. Okay, here walks in Mirka with all the pudding for everybody that had the soup already. And the German woman asked her, did you, do you have an extra pudding? She's, I can see that she moves the pudding away. But she said, no, I don't. And I'm trying to tell that woman next to me, please, here's the pudding, I'm showing it. She doesn't realize it. And me and my big mouth, I say, yeah, there is an extra pudding, I can see it. Well, she got her soup, but I got three months of prosecution. She made me clean the garbage where there were such a rats and I was so petrified of it. She went to the German woman in, 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 in the office and told her that I speak badly about the Germans. And I remember there was a German Meister. He was very kind to me. He used to feed me sometimes if he couldn't finish his sandwich. And Herman, and he called me, he says, they're calling you to the office. I don't know why, you better go. I come to the office and the German Frau Dimke looks at me and says, did you say those things about the Germans? And I look at her and I says, I never said anything bad. So she punched me in the face and she says, you're lucky we would send you away, but you have such a nice sister. So, we're not going to do it. I, I don't know if I learned my lesson to keep my mouth shut because I was in double jeopardy. But I really had some problems like that. The only hope we had during those years when we saw the American planes flying overhead and bombing the city of, of Bremen. That was because we couldn't hear anything. We never read, read, didn't read a newspaper. We didn't have access to a radio. We didn't know what was happening in the world. We didn't know if it's ever gonna end. We didn't know anything. Only those letters that we used to receive from Poland, but once in 1944, once the Russian got into Poland, that's finished too. We didn't get the letters anymore. And in the letters, she didn't write about the war either. So this was used to be like a hope, those beautiful, beautiful planes, the American and the English planes, when they were flying. I was never afraid that they're gonna, I remember my, my Aunt Rose begging me to, to go down in the middle of the night when there was an alarm. I didn't think they're gonna kill me. They were just going to hit the Germans. That's how much I understood. I don't think I understood the fullest extent of the horror of what was happening. I was too young. I don't know. It just, 
And then I, because I worked eight hours only, I used to help some Polish farmers in, in their home. And they used to give me bread, extra bread and apples. And I used to bring them home to my end and share it with them. Those were very years. Anyway, liberation. Liberation, 1945. The English liberated us. Actually, we went to, to, to meet the liberators. What happened? They stopped feeding us. We stopped working. We could hear the cannons, but we didn't know what was happening. So a few of the girls, Polish girls, and my aunt and I, we went to meet the liberators. Interesting enough, we crossed the river and we went to a little place there and there was a camp, an abandoned camp that used to help have, have uh, laborers from England, from France and Belgium. But as the English came in, they took them right away on trucks and took them home. So the, 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 this was empty, but the kitchen wasn't empty. We got into that kitchen and we started cooking and eating. There was bacon and flour and sugar and eating and cooking. And my aunt almost died. You see, her body wasn't used to eating so well. She was so deadly sick. Anyway, we wound up in a Polish VP camp in Bremen because there was no transportation. Germany was in ruins and we didn't know where to go. So the, the DP opened a Polish camp in Bremen and we stayed there for quite a few months. I don't know, the freedom of being free, they closed us and they fed us. And it was just like a miracle. We were free again. We had no connection with anybody. We didn't know anything. A few months later, when trains started moving, a cousin of my mother's, a cousin of my aunt's, that survived the same way as we did in a Polish place, worked as a Polish laborer. And she used to correspond with my aunt. She used to send letters during the years. She came looking for us. She was walking on the street and I recognized them. That was the first Jewish soul I saw. We had accumulated some things, you know, by living there a few months. So my aunt said, why don't you go to Zaltzheim, which was near Frankfurt am I, a Jewish camp where my mother's cousin was, came from. And and I'll come in a day or two and I'll pack up everything. So I picked myself up and I went to the train station to go to Zaltzheim to a Jewish camp, a Jewish DP camp. Interesting enough, they were so, it was the traveling time would have been a whole night. And there were so many people, there was no place to sit. And here I, I saw some Polish guys that I knew from camp and we started talking and we looked and we saw an empty compartment next. We thought, oh, let's go there. So the three of us went in there. Little did we know that it was reserved for a group of Jew Jewish people that just came from Poland, hated the Poles with a passion because they had plenty of trouble on the border. So a uh, at the station after we, I don't know how long we traveled, they came, a whole group of Jewish people walked into that train, that compartment. Right away, they realized that they had some Poles here. So the two Polish men didn't bother, they just walked out. But me, I couldn't walk out. It's Jew the first time I'm meeting Jewish people and they go, they want to throw me out. Out, they said to me. I says, listen, when the Polish men left, I was still afraid to admit that I was Jewish. I don't know. I said to him, I'm Jewish. He said, yeah, 
speak Jewish. I said, I can't. I couldn't remember a word. Isn't that something? And they were going to throw me out. I said, you're going to have to carry me out. I'm not leaving here because I am Jewish. That man that was running that group said, listen, she's a young girl. Maybe she is Jewish if she says so. A whole night they made me tell them stories about the Jewish holidays. And I did because this I remembered. But when I walked out in Frankfurt am Main from the train, I heard one say to the other, she must have been a maid in a Jewish home. They still didn't believe me. I guess between 13 and 16, those are the years that you develop. You become, you become a Paul. And I learned all the things I shouldn't have learned. Swearing. Gosh, did those girls swear. Unbelievable. And I knew that language perfectly well. It took me years to get over. When I speak to children, I tell them, don't start swearing because it's a terrible bad habit. You can't get rid of it. I still do it sometimes. Terrible. That's the way I came to Frankfurt am I. My aunt came. My other aunt from Russia. How did we communicate? How did we get the few people that survived together? Because we had that great aunt in Israel. And they spoke wrote to them and then that's the way we connected. My other man and came from Russia. She had a little boy that was born in Russia and she came to Salzheim and we met up and she said to me, my child, you're my sister's daughter. I have a little boy. You're going to be my daughter now. But I was still a rebel without a cause. I decided that to become a Zionist, I was going to Israel. I wasn't going anywhere else. My aunt Rose got married. My other aunts, they all wanted to go to the States. And I said, no, I'm going to Israel. Well, did you ever try to go illegally to Israel? It was no picnic. Did anybody of you travel the Alps in the middle of the winter, don't try it. The snow was up to here. I went illegally. We, they took us from Austria to Italy at night through the mountains to the, to the Alps. And in Italy, I was lucky. They put me in a camp with young people. And I stayed there for almost a year which I actually got my little bit of education. Because remember, I finished grade three and they never let me into school again. So that year that I spent in Italy in a DP camp too, Aviliano, Prof Torino, Villa Santa Augustina, you remember the address. They taught us, there were some people that were teaching us Hebrew and a little math, and a little history, and a little geography. They gave us a little of the education that we never had. How my English, not too bad, but I, I never went to school. I just learned it from reading. I'm a big ardent reader. So, well, yeah, where was I? And then I, I met my husband to be in, in Italy, he survived in, in the woods of Ukraine in a hole in the ground. He was terribly damaged this way. He lived two and a half, two years, a year and a half by, all by himself in the, in the woods, like an animal. Wasn't very easy for that boy. We got, so we, I met him in Israel, in Italy, and together, they took us on a boat one, one day in 90, beginning of 1948, I think it might have been, illegally to go to Israel. They put us on a small boat, fishing boat, 300 people, they stuck us together. We were three weeks on the Mediterranean Sea and we were cut 
are the same English. The English that we kissed their feet when they liberated us in 1945, incarcerated me in 1948 in Cyprus. So we were behind by, barbed wires again. Three months later, because I was still young, I don't know how, how much, how they did it, 18, I think, they let me into Israel in 1948 when the War of Liberation started. I happened to be there too. Israel, I loved that country, but the climate was absolutely horrible for me. I was developing kidney. I got married in 1949 and I was developing kidney stones. The doctor told me I'll never have a, a child because the, whatever I drank, I used to perspire from the heat. My aunt Rose and my aunt Bella wind up in Brooklyn, New York. And they started, the times in 1948 were very tough in Israel, very tough. That was the beginning. And I worked in a candy factory. And I was very sick all the time. And my aunt used to send me parcels from, from the United States in those years. And then they decided that they have to try and help me go to the States, but the quota to the States was very high. So they got a, a relation that lived in Canada and they contacted them and they brought me to Canada. From the first day I came to this country, I fell in love with it. The country that let me live, grow, and develop, and freedom and tranquility. And I'm very thankful to this country. I really am. When my aunt Rose wanted me to come to the States, my husband said, I like it here. And that's where we stayed. I had three children, five granddaughters, Five great grandchildren, two boys, three boys and two girls. And I've lived a long life and I'm very thankful to, to everybody that helped me survive that war, that horror. And I'm trying to tell children that hate and bigotry are the worst enemies of our society and the consequences are horrible. What did my parents do to anybody? They were decent human beings. Why was my mother dead at 40? Why was my father dead at 42? Can't answer that. Thank you. Is there any questions? Before we go to questions, Rose, I just want to, to thank you for sharing that with all of us. Um, I've had a couple of comments, not so much questions, but comments in the chat from, from viewers saying that you, how warm you are and how you're a beautiful soul that you have. And I think that that really does come through with the way you speak. And Oh, because you see, if you tell the truth and if you talk about the people that you love and don't have them anymore, how else can you be? I've, I, at first it was terrible, difficult for me when I started doing it about 17 years ago. My husband died already. I'm a widow for 21 years already. When he died, I started speaking and it filled my life actually at first. And then I realized that I'm doing something good because I'm bringing my parents back to life my family back to life. They were here, you know. I remember once a young man told me, you know what he said? You're the first person that made me feel like I actually see those people. You bring them to life. And that made me extreme, feel extremely well. So it wasn't like I'm just doing something. I'm, I'm receiving something back. When young people listen to me, when a girl said, I didn't even fall asleep. I like your story, but I didn't even fall asleep. I could have kissed her. When another girl wrote me a letter says, you know, 
I have a brother and I'm fighting with him all the time. But when I listened to you talking about your little brother, I went home and made peace. Oh, well, I once spoke in a jail. And when a young girl at the end of the session, they were so respectful. They were between 13 and 18 incarcerated. And the young girl said to me, what did you do with the hate? And I said to her, my child, I did not want to bring it into my home. Hate, I wasn't gonna give Hitler another victim because hate only destroys you. If I could put it away and start living, so can you. I hope she listened to me, I don't know. I would imagine that she did. And you're also honoring your parents and everybody else every time that you share this with all of us, because now we essentially become witnesses to your experiences. And that's also very special. And you just have this, this light about, your, about you, which is so, so special and so precious. Um, well, I want to introduce you to Michael Levitt, who's our president and CEO. And I know he wants to say a couple of words to you as well. Okay, go right ahead. I most certainly do. Hi, Rose, and, and hello to everybody that, that joined for this amazing presentation. Rose, Daniela just said it, I'll say it again. The, the, the vivid picture that you're able to create for us really takes all of us back to those moments. And, you know, whether it's the heartbreak of getting pushed off the side of the road by your, by your mom and, and, you know, how vivid you made that, or the feeling of being in Canada and you know the love you talked about having for this country, it all comes through um, just you know absolutely clearly as if we were there ourselves. And I think that's what's made you such a precious, precious um, piece of of the uh, Holocaust survivor story. Um, so much so, you talked about loving Canada, but Canada loves you. And and I'll point out for those that aren't familiar. Um, that just earlier this year, Rose was, um, was appointed to the Order of Canada, and I quote, for her inspiring discourse as a Holocaust educator and for her thought-provoking presentations on the subject. And that's been for thousands of thousands of students that have experienced that, Rose. And for all of us here today, I just want to thank you for taking us through this last hour and sharing your journey with us. Thank you for listening to me. Well, it's it's an honor, and I know that's that's how every one of us on this uh, on this Zoom forum feel this afternoon. Um, I also want to thank our partners at the Wallenberg Center, Hannah, Irwin, uh, and the whole gang over there that work so hard with us um, every other week to present this program. Um, we, you know, we we love this partnership and, and so many of the partnerships we have in the community. Um, to all of you, and I, I see some of, uh, um, some of you come every two weeks and other of you are new and joining us for the first time. But I just want to thank you um, for, you know, for joining the, uh, the Wiesenthal team, and I'll mention them as well, our Daniela and our education team, Melissa, Elena, um, Kim, Kim, Ariel, and I'm not sure who else is, uh, is online with us today, but um, we, you know, we, we do these sessions, Rose, because we know that every single person that can hear about your journey, um, about what you experienced, that can witness your testimony, um, that's how we make a difference. That's how, when it comes to the freedom and, uh, you know, what we cherish in our society today, it, it, it helps, it, it, it helps us to understand just how important, um, you know, uh, everything we're experiencing now is in relation to the past. So to all of you that are here once again with us, I want to wish you um, a safe, a happy, and a healthy Passover for you, for your families. Um, you. Please stay in touch, stay tuned. We'll have another um, In Survivor series in a couple of weeks time. Um, but once again, Rose, I uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share your journey with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, no questions. I, we have, we, there was one question that did come up, but you summed okay. everything up so nicely that I didn't want to, to interrupt you. Um, mm -hmm. So one person did want to know um, how you, 
you, you, you kind of did answer it, but they want to know how you dealt with the loss of your family at such a young age. Well, maybe because it's, it's at such a young age that somehow you manage because I feel, you see, I did not want to bring hate into my house. I didn't want to bring up my children with it. There is just no way I want to do that. And I'm so proud of them. My son was an accountant. My, my daughter, I have a daughter who was a professor, and I have a daughter who was a lawyer who works for the Children's Aid Society. Grandchildren, a social worker, a doctor, a teacher. Oh, my God. God bless them all. They all educated. And, and I'm thankful to Canada for it. that They gave me the chance to do that, the hard work. And it, it certainly hard. shows. Yeah. Again, thank you, Rose. We're unfortunately, I think, almost out of time. But again, okay. I want to thank you so much. You've just been an absolute treasure to listen to. Thank, um, you, thank you for imparting your, your wisdom and your story. On oh, all my head is going to grow too big. <laughs> all deserved and then some. Well deserved. Well yes, deserved. it is. Okay. Thank you so much, Rose. And thank okay. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, it was Thanks, a pleasure everyone. meeting you. Take care. Pleasure. Thanks, Be Rose. Well. Be well, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Rose.